Shai Calvo, the mayor of Berwyn Heights, Maryland, saw his home invaded by a county SWAT team, his family terrorized, and his two pets shot dead, all over a box of marijuana left on his doorstep. Since that time, Calvo has learned about how the federal government subsidizes these kinds of paramilitary raids with very little oversight. Calvo spoke at a Cato Institute Capitol Hill briefing held July 7, 2009. The full event is at Cato.org. What's extraordinary about my case is not that it happened, is that it actually people paid attention. Uh, and I think that's what I've come to understand, because for as much as the nightmare it was, the worst part was the county reaction to it, which offends the conscience. They concluded very quickly, quote, their guys did what they were supposed to do. Um, they recently, just in the last month, released an investigation, which the sheriff, who was his SWAT team, was a county police investigation, <coughs> said that his deputies operated to the fullest extent of their abilities. Um, the county executive even offered a pat on the back for everybody involved. That's a direct quote. And, and what, what I, you know, for me, the personal journey after the event was trying to understand how could this happen? How could a paramilitary force kick in the door of uh, uh, an innocent family, much less the mayor of the town, and have done so little investigation that they didn't know I was the mayor? They hadn't Googled my name. Uh, <laughs> they knew nothing about us. Uh, I've lived in a lovely little suburban area. They, they had done no work because apparently this is how they operate. They, the first thing they do is get a SWAT team. They shoot first. They ask questions later. And so, you know... Everyone has their way of dealing with things. My, you know, inexpensive form of therapy was try to understand it and ask a lot of questions. And what astounded me after it happened was there was virtually no information available. I asked Prince George's County Police. I filed a uh, Public Information Act, which is a FOIA version in Maryland, a FOIA in Maryland. You know, how many times have you deployed SWAT teams in a year? They wouldn't answer that. Eventually, through an un informal source, I learned about 700 times um, in 2007. Um, they indiscriminately do it for drug warrants. Um, and this is what they do. And as I come to understand this, I try to, well, how do these things play out? Uh, you know, I, I started walking down this path. And as I realized so little information was available, Prince George's County defended it, circled the wagons, refused. I did have a recourse in going to the state legislature. And, and um, I worked with some lawmakers to develop what, what is its first in the nation legislation. Uh, essentially created an oversight mechanism for SWAT teams. Uh, and, and May 19th, Governor Martin O'Malley signed the nation's first statewide oversight mechanism that requires that any law enforcement agency in the state of Maryland that has a SWAT team must periodically report, share that information on how many times, where, why, what authorization, and the result of these SWAT team deployments. That became effective on July 1. And it's something I'm really proud of. That's something good. It's meaningful to us. It's something you know, good came from our mechanism. You know, because in the course of this process, I have met so many people who have remarkably similar stories to ours as far as what happened in our home that day. But no one came to tell their story. And it's, you know, what the legislative process in Maryland was fascinating to me, not because, you know, lawmakers listened, they expected my story, but there was opposition. The police, the state police of chief, uh, state chiefs of police, um, the state sheriff association, you know, state sheriffs, uh, the state fraternal order of police, all absolutely opposed the legislation we were pushing. Again, we were pushing an oversight mechanism. It was transparency. It didn't say how they could do these deployments. It didn't say why. It didn't limit them in any way. It merely said they had to tell people after the fact, and there would be a statewide review by the governor's office at the end of the year to explain you know, paramilitary uh, deployments. And they opposed it. And they opposed it on the grounds that, essentially, you shouldn't legislate oversight. These things should be worked out in training. Lawmakers should not be setting the rules for them. And, and essentially, they were saying they didn't need oversight. And at some level, even though the bill passed the Senate uh, 43 to nothing and I think 123 to 12 in the House uh, and was signed in the, by the governor, they opposed it to the end because they did not want people to know about what was happening. And this, to me, was a first step, not a last step. Because as I got into understanding SWAT teams, what you start to realize is that paramilitary activities are fundamentally different from what police regularly do. I mean, I, I'm a mayor of my town. I have a police force, although, you know, no one ever asked me about it. Uh, Prince, you know, Berwyn Heights actually set a record low crime rate last year. 
Uh, the worst thing that happened in my town was, was, was this raid by the county. Um, uh, uh, you know, but these paramilitary forces are out there operating in our community, sometime as a first resort, and as a result, no one really knows about it. But when you think about what they do, they are fundamentally different from a, a police. They don't, you know, they're not about due process. They're not respecting their rights. They're not serving, protecting. They're searching and destroying. They're overpowering, and they're operating in a different way. They're what I thought we didn't have happen in this country. It's really something akin to what you expect to see happening in a war zone, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan. Um, and the response of the elected officials to sort of bury their heads in the sand was really disturbing. Um, and, and I understand and I respect that police have a very difficult job to do. Many of them are heroes. But in any profession, if you don't give people oversight, you start to see the standards of operations lapse. If you don't hold people to the highest standards, you know, a culture develops. And police have a different, difficult job in a difficult world, and under the best of circumstances in any profession, if you don't give them oversight, um, you know, things are going to wane. Banks, for instance. Uh, but when you give someone a badge, a gun, and a special trust, it seems to me you should also give them the oversight to make sure that they're not abusing that special trust. And I think what's happened in a lot of places is the oversight mechanism has waned. Elected officials like myself haven't done that part because that's not as sexy and it's hard. It's hard standing up to a police chief. I wasn't very comfortable doing it when I was first elected. And we had to, I had to work at that relationship to make sure that he knew he worked for me. And I didn't get involved in operational matters, but I set parameters. I set policies and I set guidelines and I demand that he had to follow them. I can also tell you, I've had to fire a couple police officers very, very difficult, very hard to do. But when they file false statements, they don't get to be police officers anymore. That's the deal. And unfortunately, that standard isn't adhered to. So um, the Maryland law was a success, and I, I, I'm really proud of what we were able to do there. But I also recognize it doesn't stop there. It starts there. And I've continued to look into the issue, and I've been thinking more about federal policy. Because what happened in my house isn't you know, in isolation. What happens in Prince George's County, while, mind you, an outlier in a troubled county in many ways, I say that as a lifelong resident and elected official there, um, it's not unique. And you start realizing when you dig a little deeper that there are federal policies that actually promote this type of behavior, this paramilitarization under, um, by, by police. I mean, I'm thinking of burn grants, which uh, is a very popular program and, and probably has a lot of merits to it. But there are also challenges. And Prince George's County got $860,000 this year in burn grant money. And essentially, there are federal subsidies being put towards what they did at my house. Um, but what's the oversight mechanism for burn grants? My understanding is all they have to report is the number of arrests and the amount of drugs seized. I mean, I get a monthly report on parking tickets issued in the town of Berwyn Heights. If Congress is funding paramilitary operations, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask the same questions that the Maryland law requires law enforcement in Maryland to provide. At a minimum, how are they using the money? If you look into burn grants, th that information is not required. Um, drug forfeiture laws. Prince George's County declares about $2.5 million in revenue this year on drug forfeiture laws. Under the federal act, there's a federal fund. It's kind of complicated. I'm trying to understand it. But it's basically a mechanism they use to seize cash and items for sale in these drug raids. When they came into my house, they were looking for cash. They, were, they found some yard sale money and got all excited and turned out it was $68 of the yard sale in the back of the envelope. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they have a, a fund in Prince George's County at $7.4 million. They're using the money they get in these raids to fund their operations. They're doing this under federal law. Shai Calvo is mayor of Berwyn Heights, Maryland. You can listen to or watch the full event at Cato.org.